Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the Science in the Quran series. This segment is titled In the Beginning. And it is indeed the beginning of one of the most exciting portions of Quran and science, which is the verses that have to do with physics and cosmology. Before going there, let me say that this presentation will be a little bit longer than usual because it has to do with something quite important and fundamental and something that we may often take for granted being born in the 20th or 21st century, but we really shouldn't. Let's begin with a verse that we are now quite familiar with, verse 190 from Surah Al-Imran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب Verily, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and in the succession of night and day, there are indeed messages for all who are endowed with insight. Now let's take a look at these verses from Surah Al-Dukhan. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا لَاعِبِينَ مَا خَلَقْنَاهُمَا إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ we created not the heavens, the earth, and all between them merely in idle sport. We created them not except for just ends, or an even better translation, except with an inner truth. But most of them do not understand. Now what do these verses have in common? They have in common the notion that the heavens and the earth were created, that they had a beginning. This, of course, is second nature to us, both as people of faith and as people who have grown up in the era of the Big Bang. But what we need to realize is that when the Qur'an made these statements, in the scientific arena, they were quite revolutionary and quite against the so-called prevailing wisdom. Since the days of Aristotle, scientists have considered the universe to be eternal, fixed, and unchanging. The ancients would often refer to the quote-unquote fixed stars. But, as we will see, this conception that the scientists have eventually changed. And let's go back to Newton's law of universal gravitation that we talked about in one of our earlier presentations. And here's the form of the law. And we talked about how amazing this was that Newton was able to come up with this and that his simple equation allowed him to very accurately, for example, calculate the orbits of planets around the sun and to show why the orbits had the periods they did and so forth. However, even though Newton's equation could describe how gravity worked, Newton himself realized that he had no idea why gravity worked. Why was there such a thing? It took a couple of hundred years for Albert Einstein to come along and propose an entirely new theory of gravitation. And this was Einstein's general theory of relativity. And what Einstein proposed, if we go here, and look at the general theory of relativity in words, that basically he said that gravitation is not due to a force, but rather it's a manifestation of curved space and time, with this curvature being produced by the mass energy and momentum content of the space-time. What does this mean? The analogy that people usually give is to think of space as a rubber sheet. And then you take a massive body, like a bowling ball, and drop it in the middle of that rubber sheet. It makes that sheet curve. And then if you were to try to slide a marble across that rubber sheet, the marble would end up spinning around the bowling ball, not because there was any particular attraction of the bowling ball to the marble, but because the, the, the bowling ball curved the rubber sheet. In the same way, the sun, for example, is considered to curve space-time. And so the earth, as it travels through this curved space, ends up spinning around or orbiting the sun because it is basically taking the shortest path it can in curved space-time. And so Einstein 
came up with a very, very radical notion of why there is such a thing as quote-unquote gravity, that it is really a curvature of space-time. Then Einstein, of course, had to try to quantify this, put it in terms of mathematical equations. And after 10 years of work, he came up with what are known as the Einstein field equations. And you see them right here. The derivation of these equations is exceedingly complex. But what basically they are saying is that mass tells space-time how to curve, and curved space-time tells mass how to move. And the left-hand side of the equation has components that quantify the curvature of space-time, and the right-hand side has components that quantify the energy density of the universe. More specifically, this is known as the Ricci tensor. Uh, this is known as the Ricci scalar. This is known as the metric tensor uh, that, quant that characterizes uh, a curved space. And this is the energy momentum tensor that quantifies the energy content of the universe. But the specifics are not so important to us right now. We will, inshallah, return to this equation uh, in a later episode and tackle it in a bit more detail. But what looks here like one equation is actually a series of 10 different equations that have to do with things known as tensors and the derivatives of tensors. And of course, were it not so complex, it would not have taken a mind like Einstein's uh, 10 years to um, come up with it. But in any case, the bottom line is he came up with these equations that related the curvature of space-time to the energy density of space-time and explained how gravity worked. However, there was a problem. And the problem is when Einstein developed these equations, let me just quote to you directly from Professor Leo Sartori's book, Understanding Relativity. To his dismay, Einstein found that the field equations of general relativity have no static solutions. What does that mean? That means that although all scientists, including Einstein, thought that the universe was fixed and eternal and unchanging, his equation said no, the universe could not be that. It either had to be expanding or contracting. And again, from Professor Stephen Barr's book, Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, the realization that the universe must be dynamic profoundly disturbed Einstein. He had naturally assumed that the universe must be static and eternal. And in fact, one of the leading physicists of the day, the British uh, mathematical physicist Sir Arthur Eddington, said that the notion of a beginning is repugnant to me, that the universe could be dynamic, could have had a beginning and be evolving, contracting, expanding. Scientists, since the days of Aristotle, thought that the universe was fixed and unchanging without beginning in either space or time. So what did Einstein do? Well, what he did is he changed his equations. This is the original set of equations we were looking at. Einstein introduced something here known as the cosmological constant. And what the cosmological constant was in some sense is a fudge factor. It can be part of the equations and the derivation of these equations Something like the cosmological constant can be introduced. It doesn't violate the physics, but Einstein initially saw no need for it. He loved the beauty of the original set of equations, but the problem was because matter attracts each other through this curvature of space-time, what we call gravitation, left alone, the universe would tend to collapse. And so, what Einstein needed was some anti-gravity force that would balance the force of gravity and balance it just right so that the universe would be static as he believed it was and as he wanted it to be. And so with the introduction of the cosmological constant, Einstein believed his equations could now describe a static and eternal universe. About 
a little more than 10 years later, something quite amazing and shocking happened. The American astronomer Edwin Hubble, on the basis of telescopic observations, actually showed that the universe was not static, that it was expanding. And he showed that the further galaxies were away from us, distance on this axis, the faster they were moving away from us. And this can only occur if the entire universe is expanding each galaxy moving away from the others. This discovery was absolutely shocking and revolutionary. And its implications? The universe was not static. Einstein and everyone else were wrong. I quote here from Professor Stephen Hawking, the very famous astrophysicist, quote, the discovery of the expansion of the universe was one of the great intellectual revolutions of the 20th century. It came as a total surprise and changed the discussion of the origin of the universe. When Einstein saw this data, he said that the cosmological constant was my greatest blunder or the biggest mistake of my life, because had he just followed the math of his equations, he would have predicted a dynamic, expanding universe purely on the basis of the physics and beaten Hubble to that discovery by a decade. Yet he was so fixated on the notion that the universe was eternal and static that, as we said, he introduced the cosmological constant. But now, what are the implications of the expanding universe? Well, if we follow that expansion backwards, it really leads to another extremely startling result in scientific terms. If the galaxies are moving away from each other, then sometime before this time, they were a bit closer together. Even further back, they were even closer together. And if we go very far back, they must have all been right on top of each other. And this indeed is the notion that physicists call the singularity and what gave rise to the Big Bang. And in fact, again, Stephen Hawking said that Roger Penrose and I were able to show that Einstein's general theory of relativity implied that the universe and time itself must have had a beginning in a tremendous explosion. So in fact, Einstein's equations plus Hubble's discovery together led directly to the notion that a very long time ago, all of matter, all of energy, all of space, everything was in one very tiny point, and then it all exploded forth. And remember, this isn't matter exploding into a space that was there. This is space itself being created. This is the moment of creation of the universe that scientists now call the Big Bang. And in fact, Scientists even then were not ready to accept this, and the name Big Bang was coined by Fred Hoyle, an astrophysicist who didn't really accept this idea and was saying it uh, mockingly, that you expect something to the effect that you expect us to believe that the universe started in a Big Bang, yet the name stuck, and over time, with further scientific investigation, most scientists now accept this idea. But we have to realize that didn't come easily. Even in the late 1950s, uh, from this article in Scientific American, two-thirds of leading American astronomers and physicists still believed that the universe had no beginning. This was more than 40 years after Einstein came up with his field equations and close to 30 years after Hubble showed that the universe was dynamic and expanding. Yet, forward another 10 or 20 years, now essentially all scientists accept the notion of the Big Bang. And this notion implies, contrary to 2,000 years of scientific dogma, that the universe indeed did have a beginning, that there was a moment, quote-unquote, of creation. And to us, as people of faith, this is no surprise. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Surah Al-Imran 190, in the creation of the heavens and the earth. 
And so for us, of course, we take this for granted, both as people of faith and as people who have grown up in the era of the Big Bang. But we need to step back and realize that when the Bible and the Quran made these statements, they were absolutely revolutionary and profound in scientific terms. And for the longest time, it seemed that scientists were correct and they referred to these religious texts as so-called creation myths. But lo and behold, after somebody really coined a very beautiful analogy, that after 2,000 years of climbing the mountain of science, and discovering that the universe did have a beginning, that there was a moment of creation of space and time, as scientists ascended that mountain of knowledge, when they got to the summit, who did they find there? The people of faith. And so we need to appreciate and not take for granted these verses that simply talk about the notion of creation. Because now, after 2,000 years, this has become an accepted scientific notion. From here on out, inshallah, we will begin to take a more specific look at ideas of physics and cosmology as they relate to the Quran. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.